I received an email with a question about John 14:12 and how the charismatics use John 14:12. So I want to look at that and then also look at why the charismatic movement is a bad movement. But John 14:12 says, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father." So if you have believed on Jesus Christ, you have the power to do incredible works. However, it doesn't have anything to do with you being good yourself, but because Jesus Christ, who is good, now lives in you. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You allow Jesus Christ to work through you. And you may not walk on water like he did when he was here. You may not raise the dead or read people's minds or calm a storm or heal the blind or heal the lame or put a man's ear back on his head. But Jesus Christ, through all born-again believers, can go places that Jesus Christ did not go when he was walking on this earth. Now, I don't apply John 14, 12 to me in the sense I'll be able to walk on water and even go beyond that and do handstands and backflips while I'm walking on the water. But Jesus Christ will do great works through born-again believers, even greater works. However, he still gets the glory, and nobody is outdoing him. If anything, he would just be outdoing what he himself had already done, because any good thing that you do is simply Jesus working through you. Now, what the Charismatics want to do is use this verse to, to teach that they're going to do greater things than, than Jesus even did when he was here. And meaning like supernatural things that you can physically see with your eyes. If a Charismatic wants to use this verse to claim he can do the things Jesus and the Apostles did, then he is mistaken. I mean, even magicians today want to copy the miracles of Jesus Christ. I think it was Chris Angel who faked raising someone from the dead. He faked walking on the water. You know, people want to do those things, but God's not working that way during this time that we're in. And if charismatics today really do have some power, then it doesn't mean it's from God necessarily. As we know, the magicians under Pharaoh had a little bit of power. Not as much as Moses and Aaron, but they had some power. Simon the sorcerer had a little bit of power. And the devil likes to counterfeit the things of God. But as a Christian, you let the Lord work through you. And even the, the apostles, they actually had the sign gifts. And then when they were still using the sign gifts, it says, The Lord working with them. In Mark 16, 20, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, The Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. If the Lord's not working with you, then... You don't have anything. Also remember that a man doesn't have to have signs and wonders and miracles to be doing a great work. So when John 14, 12 says you're going to do greater works than these, it doesn't necessarily mean walking on the water, raising the dead. Because look at this. You don't have to have miracles to do a great work. Look in Matthew eleven eleven. It says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women... There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And you know what's said about John the Baptist is he did no miracle. Yet, Jesus said, There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Uh, doing great things doesn't mean doing supernatural things before the eyes of people. But we know that charismatics interpret John 14, 12 wrong. And this is going to be kind of long, but I'm going to show you why they're wrong. They want to say that they can do all these supernatural things, but they're forgetting something. Number one, signs, the signs are for Israel, not the church. 1 Corinthians 1, says, For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Jews are the ones that require a sign. 1 Corinthians 14.22 says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, 
not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So when you see someone speaking in tongues in the Bible, it isn't some type of unknown prayer language that they claim it is. You'll notice in Acts 2.6, the people heard them speak in their own language. You'll notice that when someone speaks in tongues, that it is a sign to an unbelieving Jew that's present. It isn't for the purpose of showing you possess the Holy Ghost. We know that we receive the Holy Ghost the moment we believed and He permanently indwells us ever since. Because in Romans 8 and 9 it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This shows that those who are saved have the Holy Spirit, and that those who are not saved do not have the Holy Spirit. And I want you to realize that the signs were for Israel and that God was using the signs to confirm to unbelieving Jews the message that was being presented was the real message from God. In Hebrews 2.3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. He was bearing the things witness with signs, wonders, and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. And we know that Jesus Christ did many miracles uh, trying to convince the people that he was who he said he was. So what was the purpose? To confirm that he was who he said he was to the Jews. In John 5, 36, it says, But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. So the works that Jesus did, it bore witness. It was a confirmation. In John 10, 25, Jesus answered, Then I told you, and you believe not, the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. In John 10, 37 and 38, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works. If you're not even going, if you're not going to believe him, believe the works that he did. That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. When he was telling them what to tell John about whether or not he was truly the Lord, he started naming off the miracles he had performed as confirmation. In Luke 7, 9, uh, 7, 19 through 22, it says, And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour... He cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. So Jesus was confirming what was true with the signs the raising the dead, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. All of these signs were for confirmation that the message was the real thing. Then in Acts 22, Acts 2, 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So he was approved by miracles, wonders, and signs. Because the Jews require a sign, he came into his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. They rejected him even though he had all those signs. Now me and you, we don't require a sign. We believe the scriptures. Peter saw the miracles and performed the miracles himself even. Yet he still teaches that the words of God are more sure than any sign or wonder because he says in 2 Peter 1.19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So the signs are for Israel. 
the signs confirm the word, but we don't require a sign, but, and we have a more sure word of prophecy. We got the King James Bible. We don't need our pastor to get up every Sunday and do something supernatural to confirm to us the word being preached. We automatically believe the words. Or uh, hopefully you do. So, number one, the signs are for unbelieving Jews. I also remember that today, number two, we operate by faith and not sight. If my pastor had to get up every Sunday and speak in tongues or heal somebody or something like that for me to believe what he's saying, I'm not operating by faith. I'm operating by sight. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. I believe by faith that the King James Bible is the Word of God. I don't need my pastor to perform a miracle to confirm the words. I'm accepting it by faith. And you see, the disciples were using the sign gifts to confirm the words they were speaking. In Mark 16, 15 through 20, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, underline it, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. Now look at this verse circle it underline it and they went forth and preached everywhere the lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following it wasn't to prove that you were more spiritual than everybody else it was to confirm the word to unbelieving jews and look at the signs that they could do it wasn't just speaking in tongues that's the most popular one because that's the easiest to counterfeit it says they shall take up serpents that's where people the crazy people in the mountains get the idea for snake handling but that's not what the disciples were doing for example the apostle paul uh, a, a, a snake grabbed a hold of him and he just shook it off and it didn't hurt him and and it was a a sign to the people around him there's something going on here you know, that's not normal for a man to get to get bit by a venomous snake and just be able to shake it off. That's what it was. It wasn't dancing with snakes, but that's the counterfeit for it. You see it today, which is not nowhere near as popular as speaking in tongues. Then it says, and if they drink any deadly thing there in Mark 16, 18. Now, that's something I've, I've never heard of or seen anybody doing is, you know, I've never seen a preacher or somebody get up and drink some type of poison or something to, to, to make you think he was spiritual and then it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover there's the probably the second most popular one the so-called faith healing where they teach that they can lay hands on you and heal you we'll see what doesn't make any sense is the uh, the people that profess to do these things today they should be able to do all these things the disciples could do all of these things signs but today you don't see people that can do all of these things they really can't do any of them they counterfeit some of them but if you if you say you can speak in tongues shouldn't you be able to drink any deadly thing shouldn't you be able to take up a serpent and if it bites you it won't hurt you you see people are are out to make themselves look spiritual when they're really not and they're forgetting, as Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy in 2 Peter 1.19. We don't need miracles performed for us today. We don't require a sign. So remember that. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't need my pastor to get a bunch of snakes and handle them for me to believe what he's saying. I believe the King James Bible as it says it. Now also remember right division. Number three. Right division. The church age that we're in today is different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God was dealing with Israel. And then the church age is different than the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble because during that time, he's also dealing with Israel. 
Now, a great Old Testament example in Exodus chapter 4. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 is great for this topic. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1. You're going to see how the children of Israel require a sign from Moses for them to believe that he is God's man. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. They, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. So here you have Moses, the first what they call a snake handler. You see, they do that unbiblically today, but as a sign to Israel, Moses could throw down his rod, it would become a snake, and then he could pick it up, and it would become a rod again. So he was the first snake handler, in a way. And it says that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. Unto thee. So it says that they may believe they needed signs to believe. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So here you have Moses, the first faith healer. He healed himself. They try to counterfeit that, counterfeit that today. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first, listen to this, of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So Moses was given signs. And God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament. Today he's dealing with the church. He'll be dealing with Israel again when the church leaves. And that's why you see the signs will come back in that future time period. And that's why the devil in that future time period will counterfeit those signs. Just like he's doing today. But he'll have even, you know, more uh, power to do so during that time because the signs come back. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, it says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And in Revelation 13, 13 and 14, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. See, they even try to counterfeit the signs today. I, I seen not too long ago some fake pastor in Africa claims to have these <clears throat> gifts, and he can bring supposedly a tornado at any time and things like that but i wanted to show you something else getting further looking at the tongues thing because that's the big one for them the times that men spoke in tongues in the book of acts i want to show you that see there's only three times in the bible where men actually speak in tongues notice in acts 2 1 it starts with the word and if you look at acts chapter 2 which is where they'll take you to show you tongues. Notice that Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 starts with the word and. And this means it's continuing from the last chapter. Now I want you to look back at Acts chapter 1 verses 24 through 26. Pause this if you want to and look at Acts 1 24 through 26. It says, And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, Show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So what's the context of who it's talking about? Is the twelve apostles. That's who you're talking about going into Acts chapter 2. So the context is twelve 
Jewish apostles. Acts 2, 1. And, and when the day of, full, day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, so that they which are speaking in tongues, according to context, are those twelve Jewish disciples. And also notice that in the crowd, what you have is Jews. Acts 2, 4, and 5. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, showing that tongues are a sign to unbelieving Jews. That's who's present, are unbelieving Jews. Also take note that the tongues are known languages. These are not some type of heavenly prayer language as they want to say. In Acts 2, 6 through 8, it says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So you can see this chapter was doctrinally to the nation of Israel a people that just crucified their Messiah, a people that require a son to believe. And that's why Peter says in Acts 2, 22, Ye men of Israel, ye men of Israel, it's Jews, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. Approved by miracles, wonders, and signs because they require a sign. That's what Peter's doing now with those apostles speaking in tongues as a sign. Which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Also notice that even the water baptism in Acts chapter 2 is a completely different baptism than the believer's baptism of a New Testament Christian. Look at Acts 2.36. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So even that baptism was directed to Israel, who just crucified their Messiah. Now, that was the first time someone spoke in tongues. We see how the Jews require a sign. Tongues are for a sign. The first time somebody speaks in tongues, it was a sign to unbelieving Jews that require a sign. Now, the second time someone speaks in tongues in the book of Acts is once again going to be a sign to unbelieving Jews. Now, as you know, Cornelius was a just man. He didn't completely know the truth, so the Lord was obligated to send him a messenger, and he sends him Peter. Peter is a Jew, the same one who is preaching in Acts chapter 2. And the tongues in this instance will be a sign to Peter and his Jewish friends that the gospel had also gone to the Gentiles, Cornelius. And it's a little bit different than Acts 2, but it's still a sign. And it's still to unbelieving Jews. Now, Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, which would be Jews, believed. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now notice here in Acts 10, these guys got the Holy Ghost before they were even baptized. The book of Acts is a transition book. And there are so many variations of, of how things happen in this book that you shouldn't base your doctrine for you today just off the book of Acts. Because it's a transition book. But you see what happened is those Jews required a sign. Peter and his buddies. And through that speaking in tongues, they realized... They were astonished because that on, the, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So tongues were for a sign to those unbelieving Jews. Now notice in Acts 10, these guys got baptized after they got the Holy Ghost. That's important as well. And then we get to Acts 19 and you have the third time someone is speaking in tongues. Once again, it's going to be a sign to unbelieving Jews. In Acts 19, 1 through 3, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts and came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much heard 
as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So these were men who had been following the teaching of Apollos. He was a mighty man in the scriptures, but there was one problem. He had still been preaching John's baptism and not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you'll see that a couple of Christians showed him the right doctrine in Acts chapter 18. Look at Acts 18, 24 through 28. Now look at this. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He wasn't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So the people in Acts 19 were disciples of Apollos, a Jew. They were Jews, and this guy had been teaching only the baptism of John to them. Now Paul's going to show these disciples the way God more perfectly, as Aquila and Priscilla did uh, Apollos. So Paul shows them the way of God more perfectly, and he lays hands on them, and they speak in tongues. Once again, tongues, a sign of confirmation to unbelieving Jews that what was taking place was from God. And you'll, if you go on and read in Acts 19, you'll see how Paul was around that synagogue. Jew, that's Jewish. These tongues were a sign to unbelieving Jews. Now, many charismatics want to believe that all true Christians will speak with tongues. And Paul teaches the opposite. In 1 Corinthians 1, 12, 29 through 31, he says, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show out unto you a more excellent way. So Paul plainly teaches here that not all speak with tongues because the answer to these questions is all no, not all speak with tongues. And Paul even says in verse 31 that he would, he will show them a more excellent way and that they should covet earnestly the best gifts. And then this is after he mentions tongues dead last in the list of gifts. What the Corinthians have in 1 Corinthians 14, the popular chapter on tongues, is a counterfeit tongues. They are trying to show how spiritual they are with counterfeit tongues. And Paul spoke 1 Corinthians when he spoke it. It was taking place during Acts 20 when a transition was still taking place going from the Jew to Gentiles. There were still some people with legit tongue speaking going on during that time. But what the Corinthians had was a counterfeit of the real thing, and Paul wasn't endorsing their tongues. He was telling them how not to do things. So I believe tongues have temporarily ceased today, but God isn't dealing with the Jews at this moment because they are blind in part, according to Romans eleven twenty five. This is the same reason I believe the rest of the sign gifts have temporarily ceased as well. I don't believe they completely cease until Jesus comes at the second coming. Because of 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, it says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Jesus Christ is that which is perfect. And it says, Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. When, when that which is perfect has come, that stuff's going to be done away. And the Jesus Christ is that which is perfect. And don't let it, just because it says that which, they say, well, it can't be referring to Jesus because it says that, it doesn't say that who, it says that which. Well, what about I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me? So don't let that throw you off. But uh, many people say that that which is perfect refers to the complete Bible. So they teach that since we have a complete Bible today, that there is no need for tongues ever again. Which it, prob that, uh, it probably did stop. Uh, that probably did have something to do with it stopping when the Bible was complete. But we j I just don't believe that there uh, 
completely done away until the second coming because I believe the sign gifts actually come back in the great tribulation when God is once again dealing with the Jews and the Jews require a sign so the sign gifts come back crazy supernatural things are more out in the open during that time the next thing that is big among charismatics is heal the healing stuff the apostles had the gift of healing notice what the apostle Paul could do in Acts 19 11 through 12 and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits, spirits went out of them. So Paul could just send a handkerchief to somebody that was sick, and it would heal them. Look what Peter could do in Acts 5.15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So Peter's shadow going by somebody could heal him. It seems as the transition period from God dealing with Israel to God dealing with the church, going from the uh, Jew to the Gentile, as that transition period went on, the signs began to be less and less. And Paul wasn't using his healing anymore. Because he says in 1 Timothy 5.23, he says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and not often infirmities. And uh, he says uh, that he left Trophimus at Miletum sick. So why would he leave them sick? Why would he tell them to use something for their stomach when he could just send them an apron or something? I definitely believe that God heals people even today. He created my body in such a way that it could even heal itself. Isn't it crazy that when you get a cut after a few days it gets better even if you don't do anything to it? I just I don't even use medicine. I don't even use cut medicine. I, I try not to even take a Tylenol. I just let stuff heal on its own. Because most stuff that happens to me, I, I just don't even seek help for it. It just heals on its own. When I get a cold, I just suffer it out. God puts stuff in your body to heal you automatically. So God heals people. But what I don't believe as a Bible believer, is the Benny Hinn nonsense, the faith healer nonsense. When someone is claiming to have the power of healing, as the apostles had it, these are lying crooks. And you want to be like they are in Revelation 2, 2, which says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. See, Benny Hinn is nothing but a false apostle. And 2 Corinthians 11, 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And since healing is a sign gift, according to Mark 16, this has temporarily stopped as God has stopped dealing with the Jews. It will be picked up again in the next dispensation when God goes back to dealing with the Jews. And we know that Moses healing himself in Exodus chapter 4 was called a sign. And we know that this sign was to the children of Israel to prove to them that Moses was sent from God. It's a sign of confirmation. The faith healers today will scam people. They say if, if the person doesn't get healed, it's because that person didn't have enough faith. Jesus and the apostles could raise people from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus. He didn't have faith. He was dead. Peter raised Tabitha back to life. She was dead. She didn't have faith. So the apostles didn't ask for money when they healed people. The faith healers today are all about money. They are one of the big reasons why every other lost person on this planet thinks preachers are money hungry. And if a charismatic does heal someone today, this doesn't mean it's from God. Because as you've already seen, the devil has power to heal. In Revelation 13, the Antichrist's deadly wound is healed. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, it shows he will have power, signs, and lying wonders. Also remember that Judas Iscariot had the power of healing in uh, John 6, 70. Jesus Christ called him a devil. The devil can heal people and deceive people. Something else about this movement, this charismatic movement, is that they will go by experience over the words of God. They will make, a bad, uh, they will make bad decisions because they base, on, base everything on how they feel over what the Bible actually says. Today, we aren't trying to convince people by performing miracles. We're not trying to convince them that way. We're trying to show them the Word of God. We're not trying to bring in a kingdom through physical weapons. We're trying to bring in a kingdom through preaching the Bible. We're trying to get them into the kingdom of God. We're not trying to bring in the, the kingdom of heaven with physical weapons like they were in the Old Testament. 
But 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapon to get people to believe are words. And we don't confirm the words with signs. God's word will confirm itself. And the fact that the Bible is relevant today and telling us the future before it happens is just confirming itself.